Otis framing of the age of exploration and European colonialism is wrong. And this video was made to expose him because even Gota makes mistakes. But first, let me tell you a story. A story that starts the second European stepped foot on the so-called New World. Ever since that moment, indigenous peoples have resisted and that initial fire of resistance has yet to be extinguished. Rather, that initial fire has been passed on from generation to generation through stories and so I shall follow my great-grandmother's Cree tradition by sharing a story. However, this is not simply a story, but rather it's fire, and may this fire aid those who are currently resisting and those who must resist in the future. In my millionth time re-watching the anime One Piece, I began to think critically about the Sky Island arc known as Sky Pia. For whenever I get to this part, I am struck with awe at how Oda starts the arc by having a galleon drop on the crew. I get distracted by Cricket's words on romance and Luffy and Bellamy's ideological clash about dreams because dreams never die <laughs> There is also the bombastic moment of the crew sailing up a vertical pillar of ocean to reach the heavens. But once they are 10,000 meters above sea level, they enter what is dubbed as God's Land. And the viewer enters Oda's take on colonialism, land back, and liberation. So for those who slept on this arc, or skipped it, strap in and make sure you like, comment, hit that bell, and subscribe for more One Piece video essays. Before I go back 400 years into the past, let me first explain Skypea and how the crew finds their way to the sky. On the Straw Hat's voyage through the Grand Line, a massive galleon drops from the heavens, and the log points to the sky. Now a lot of fans of the series loves this arc, because Oda's imagination is let loose, and he showcases what is possible in this world. For example, people can travel to the moon. However, entwined with Luffy's journey to Skypea is the story of the explorer Mont Blanc Noland and his descendant story of trying to find the legendary mythical city of gold. Oda introduces Noland's story through a storybook that mythologizes the past and presents a dominant historical narrative that Noland was a liar who lied about the City of Gold and ridiculed a king. However, Luffy believes Montblanc Cricket and Noland, much like how Luffy believes in the existence of a Sky Island because he is a dreamer and dreams never die. But once Luffy and the crew make it to the sky, they are deemed as invaders by a guerrilla warrior, setting a theme for the rest of the arc. And further, they are deemed as criminals by the Sky Islanders because of their illegal entrance. 
this criminality imposed by god Enel drives the plot as half the crew are sent to god's land known as upper yard as sacrifices and luffy sanji and usopp have to save them and confront god and his priests a few episodes into skypea proper nami finds the second half of Cricket's house, coming to the conclusion that the chunk of land known as Upper Yard was once part of Jaya, and that Noland didn't lie. Rather, his descendant, Cricket, has been looking in the wrong direction. <laughs> Four hundred years ago in the One Piece world, a knock-up stream lifted half of the island of Jaya and shot it 10,000 meters into the sky. The island would land on the White White Sea, and the second it did, settlers from the neighboring Sky Island would invade it. The man leading the charge refers to himself as God. With the ringing of the bell, a war would begin between the Shandians, the indigenous peoples of Jaya, and the Sky Islander. A war that would continue for 400 years, as the fire the indigenous peoples held never vanquished, and it was kept alive through the oral tradition. Why did the Sky Islanders want Jaya? Why is a chunk of rock so valuable? There are two answers to these two questions. The island was considered holy because of the ringing of the golden bell, which became known to the people of the sky as the song of the island. The second answer is connected to verth or soil. Verth is something that is cherished by the people of the sky because they lacked access to natural soil and so this land was automatically deemed as God's land. This claiming of land runs similar to how Europeans claimed the New World, and further like the Europeans, the people of the sky would wage a war against the Shandians to steal their lands so that they may grow their food and civilize it through agriculture. Thus, the Sky Islanders held a similar understanding of land to the Europeans in our world, as they wanted to claim it all and had armies to protect their stolen lands. This understanding is showcased by Gunfall. During peace talks, the god at the time, Gunfall, tells the warrior Wiper that he cannot return the lands to the Shandians because he loves pumpkin juice, implying that the Sky Islanders have been using the verth to grow their crops. This remark angers Wiper because, like, what kind of a justification is that? The second instance can be seen in the final battle against Enel, as in the final battle, ex-god Gunfall finally comes to an understanding that Verth cannot be owned or tamed, meaning prior to this moment, he held the same beliefs his ancestors held. This type of colonization may be foreign to some. But this was the initial aims of colonization employed by the Scottish and the British. The first islands that fell victim to brutal agricultural revolution experiments were Ireland and the island of Barbados, as it was in these islands where the plantation project was first employed. The act of civilizing the land was a core component to colonization as these free lands could supply Europe with food or grow cash crops like sugar. 
This type of colonization would later transform into settler colonialism, and it would be perfectly applied and practiced by the Americans and Canadians on the prairie. <sighs> Let's return back to the figure of God. In this context, God is the ruler or the king of the heavens. But Oda may be sliding in the fact that almost all colonial projects were backed by religious authorities and were committed in the name of God. One only has to look at the Spanish conquerors who read a requirement that basically said it was Spain's divine right to take possession of the territories of the New World, subjugate, exploit, enslave, and that they had every right to fight and kill those who went against God's plans. Or the French, as when Jacques Cartier arrived onto the eastern shores of Turtle Island, one of the first things he did was to forcefully erect a cross. Now, did the indigenous peoples welcome this intrusion? No. No, they did not. Because why should the invaders have permission to erect such a landmark? In both examples, the European colonizers used Catholic Christian theology to justify their king's colonization projects as if one were to dig deeper it became a colonization of the mind. However, God did not disappear from the colonization equation once Europeans began to settle on the stolen lands. Rather, religion would be used to civilize indigenous peoples because the spirituality that was woven into indigenous peoples every day was considered heathenistic, similar to witchcraft, primitive. But further, indigenous spirituality contested and openly challenged Christianity and Victorian capitalism. Once Christianity became the dominant faith, the settler colonists would outlaw indigenous spirituality by amending one of the most racist pieces of legislation, the Indian Act. Finally, in Canada, the church played a vital role in the residential schools, which were used to commit a cultural genocide on kidnapped indigenous children. The church has not answered for its crimes yet, and thus indigenous peoples of Canada are similar to the Shandians, as there is a rejection of God and trauma with religious authorities. For much like the indigenous peoples of today, the Shandians did not surrender, and for 400 years, they resisted, rejected God, and have fought to reclaim their lands through the flame of Kalgura, and so they may light the fire of Shandara. Fire is a key component to indigenous resistance movements and survival. Before I could talk properly about why the elements of fire, water, and earth are significant to indigenous peoples, let me first tell you about two modes of being. The first is one that existed for thousands of years in the land known as Turtle Island. For indigenous peoples across the continent all shared some core idea of being in a circle. In this mode of being, all beings are equal, and they are all interconnected or in relation to one another. From fire to water to clay to the mountains, the oceans, the rivers, the wolves, the bears, the bisons, and us, the little people. All beings are connected. The second mode of being is one that was utilized by the Europeans and was brought over to Turtle Island. And it is one of the triangle. This mode of being is rigid, it is hierarchical and human-centric. 
For God apparently created man first and gave man dominion over the animal. This elevated position made it so that the animal were inferior to man and further that man was in competition with nature. There are three things that sit atop this model. Power, severance, and apathy. As man stood apart from the natural world and this positionality gave white men the power to subjugate both indigenous peoples and the natural world. Why? Because God gave these Christians a justification and a duty. However, this is where the elements swing back into the story. For water symbolized life. Earth or clay symbolized how the creator molded humans and that humans were directly connected to the world and not above it. Finally, fire. Fire symbolized spirit. It symbolized resistance and community. However, in the context of one piece, the fire of Shandara symbolizes both the act of resistance and the act of rejecting God. But also to light the fire of Shandara extends to ringing the giant golden bell to inform lost souls that Shandora is still here. There is also the fire of Kalgara, which is Kalgara's will that has been passed on from generation to generation. Kalgara's will is one of resistance which the warrior Wiper would inherit through the oral tradition because words, no, stories are a kind of fire. A kind of fire that fills the soul or the heart with passion and a desire to fight. Thus the war in the sky is not a simple war, rather it's an anti-colonial struggle as Wiper and the Shandian warriors reject God and fight to reclaim their homeland from a colonial force. This resistance spans 400 years, because it does not simply end once the Shandians are given a sliver of their land back. Rather, the resistance ends once all is returned and God is dragged out of his position. <laughs> One thing that kept bugging me when I watched this arc this time around was why didn't Roger ring the bell? Or why didn't Gold D. Roger help the Shandian? Now the obvious answer was that Roger was running out of time and so he followed a certain path to the final island and part of that path was to stop at Skypea so that he may have Odin write and pass knowledge to the future. That if someone follows a certain poneglyph path they will reach the last island Laughtail and the Rio or the real poneglyph can be woven. However, what if Roger is a stand-in for how most outsiders view colonialism? That to Roger, it wasn't his business, and thus he did not aid the Shandians because he did not care. This can be seen with how some people view the current occupation of Palestine by the settler colonial Israeli state. That what Israel is doing doesn't impact them. So why should they stand shoulder to shoulder with the oppressed Palestinians? What I'm saying here is that Roger's non-action 
is in fact an action, as by not ringing the bell, the war raged on. Maybe one can counter and say that Roger may have heard the voice of the bell or the poneglyph, and the bell may have told him it wasn't the time. Much like how, in spoilers here, when Roger reached Laugh-Tale, he discovered it wasn't the right time, and the will of Joy Boy was to be inherited by somebody else. All in all, Luffy differs from Roger in the respect that he doesn't rush past islands. He sits and he listens to Cricket's story, and Luffy comes to the conclusion that he could tell old man Cricket that the city of gold was in the sky by ringing the golden bell. Aww. Luffy is a revolutionary character in that regard, and yeah, he may have not done it for Wiper or the Warriors or Shandia, but in some twist of destiny, all of the threads weave into Luffy's actions. Before I can expand on Luffy's role, let's talk about the Noland in the room and how Oda explores the age of exploration through the use of the Noland flashback. Oda, 400 The One Piece world harkens back to the Age of Exploration through the use of the Noland flashback. Before I talk about the Noland in the room, however, I must address how Oda respectfully treats the oral tradition indigenous peoples use and how indigenous stories are linked to history. The flashback begins with a secondary flashback as Wiper remembers what set him on his mission. In this secondary flashback, we see a young Wiper who is eager to learn about his ancestor Kalgara. The chief tells Wiper that Kalgara had a friend and a single regret. He then tells the story as the viewer gets sent back 400 years into the past and meet Wiper's ancestor, Kalgara, who is kicking invaders out as he pulls a move that resembles Monkey D. Garp. As Kalgara does not simply kick the invaders out, but he demolishes their ship and burns it to the ground. We then jump to the village and learn that the ancient Chandians are sick, but they refer to the sickness as a curse. So to lift this curse, a priest orders a beautiful girl to be offered to the gods and a ritual begins. We then jump to Noland, who is on another voyage across the Grand Line. Noland in this time frame is a renowned explorer who, in a storm, finds Jaya thanks to the ringing of the Golden Bell. Noland and his crew make landfall and find a young boy called Seta. Since the ship is made up of herbologists and doctors, they instantly notice that he is sick with tree fever and give him medicine. Once the medicine has been distributed, they head into the village. The ritual commences and the indigenous peoples call forth to their gods. The sun god the Earth God, and the God of the Forest. It's here where Noland jumps into the water and kills a god. It's also here where things get a bit problematic. <laughs> Nolan immediately calls this practice barbaric and shames the indigenous peoples. He then asks if they know what progress is and claims that he has access to it 
through the means of a cure. So let's pause here and dissect why I find this problematic. First, Oda is showcasing the people's relations to forgotten gods. As spoilers, like big spoilers, Luffy's fruit is the sun god Nika. And storytelling wise, Oda used this moment to highlight how people forgot about the gods. But Nolan's speech on progress is the exact same rhetoric European colonizers used to justify their colonization of Turtle Island and later Africa. Maybe this is how Oda imagined how the first contacts went. That if Columbus ran into indigenous peoples and found them sacrificing people, he would get up there, slay a god, and start lecturing them about medicine and science. What is missing here, though, is how knowledgeable indigenous peoples were with natural medicine, and having Nolan walk in and find a cure through using tree bark is iffy and a total slap on the face. It's iffy because that's exactly the medicine indigenous peoples used, but I guess Oda had to do this in order to frame Nolan as the savior of the village, but this bleeds into the white savior trope, and it demeans indigenous peoples and their access to their own medicine systems. So I guess I find this problematic because to a lot of kids, this may be the first time they see indigenous representation in manga or on screen, and maybe some of them attained the reading that indigenous peoples used barbaric methods and thus the settlers brought them progress and civility. On top of that, apparently, indigenous peoples were stubborn, much like the Shandians, and rejected progress. When that's not what happened. There are a variety of examples of indigenous peoples meshing European technologies to their way of life, like horses or the bison hunts on the plains where both rifles and horses were used by the Métis people. Furthermore, and as I said before, indigenous peoples had their own medicine systems and when they did get infected by the Europeans, they sought out medicine and continuously asked or sought them because they knew how vital they were to save their people from dying from disease. Thus, Oda's framing here that Europeans brought progress and the indigenous peoples were stuck in their ancient barbaric ways is not only problematic, but it's wrong. Oda's framing of Noland is wrong. Noland here is framed as this enlightened thinker who is quite atheist and rational and this framing is dead wrong because the explorers and those who took part in the age of discovery were very much Christian and they were not open-minded. For anything that differed from the Christian norm was marked as heathenistic and had to be eliminated or converted. So in this regard, Oda is wrong and he almost removes the involvement of religion and its role in the colonization process because of how anti-God Noland is. Now, my take may be wrong, because Oda is grabbing and pulling from a variety of indigenous peoples as he is not referring to a single nation. This can be seen through the architecture, which resembles Mayan and Inca, but then there are totem poles, which were used by the indigenous peoples of North America. In terms of spirituality, Oda seems to have linked the Shandians to the practices of the Mayans, the Incas, and the Aztecs, who all worshipped a sun god and had priests who offered humans to the gods. However, were these rituals used to lift curses? No. Rather, the rationale behind them was for survival. 
And to a degree, Oda does show this, as the ritual is only done because there is a disease. And further, Oda shows the tension as we have Kalgara and his wife, who are deeply hurt and deeply tense that they have to offer their own daughter. And once Nolan saves the village, Kalgara is found hugging his daughter, crying, and is grateful to Nolan. Yet, simply deeming human sacrifice as a barbaric practice feeds into settler colonial propaganda. And rather, I think viewers should try to attain a deeper understanding. However, progress aside, Oda shows us something rather remarkable, as Noland and Kelgara have this nuanced discussion about gods and how Noland values human life over a god's wishes. Noland, unlike the Europeans, actually cares about these people and doesn't want anything in return for his service. He just wants them to live and be happy because he knows thousands around the world have died from this disease. Nolan the Explorer and Kalgara the Warrior soon become best of friends as we are shown the city of gold in its full glory. Kalgara also explains the importance of the bell and its role. Its ringing calls the souls of the ancestors back to the island, back home. As each time it is rung, the Shandians are proudly saying, We are here. As time jumps, we see Kargara and Nolan bond. Yet, interrupting these joyful scenes is the swinging of an axe chopping down trees. Knowing the symbolism, each time a tree was cut, I felt a pang of pain. Because Oda did his research here, and the ancestral grove is a real thing in many indigenous cultures, such as the Hodini no Shoni people. However, tensions flare because Noland and his crew cut down the Shandian's ancestral grove. But Noland's doctor explains that those trees were infected and Noland wanted to ensure that his friends and the future generations were safe. The whole flashback shows an alternative of two worlds coexisting, but Oda does not shy away from the legacy of colonialism. As Noland ventures back to his kingdom and naively tells his king of the city of gold. The king, with Nolan's help, travels back as the king wanted to rob the Shandians of their gold, but they find the island cut in half, for Kargara and his people were shot up into the heavens, and a war that would span 400 years would begin. Final note before we move on, Oda focusing on gold further adds to how Nolan's story mirrors Columbus as the Spanish were enticed because of the discovery of gold in the New World, and much like this king, they would commit a genocide to steal it. Back when I was reading Brittany Luby's book, Damned, there was a moment that reminded me of Kargara's words, that the bell is rung to proudly state that Shandara is still here. As the Anishinaabe of the Lake of the Woods would use water drums as a form of resistance to settler colonial presence. The drumming of the water drum would be done at night in the misty lakes, and throughout the night, a haunting sound could be heard, as the sound echoed and was sent miles and miles through the use of the water. 
It was a sound that told the colonists that indigenous peoples were still here and that they were still resisting. For indigenous peoples, the drum was used to light the sparks in one's heart, causing it to beat, and once the heart began to pound, it would be like one spirit was lit on fire. This description directly links to how Oda uses drums, as in the One Piece world, there exists a thing known as the Drums of Liberation. In the late stages of the arc, Skypiea becomes a battle royale, but the final five contestants point their swords against God. Enel is lightning which in Japanese is said as Kami Nari, meaning he is lightning, but it's also a god pun. In being lightning, he mops the floor with Robin, Gunfall, and Zoro until Wiper comes in with Sea stone shoes and uses a reject dial. Like Oda is right on the nose with the rejection of God. But, and this was wild at the time, and it still is because Enel reboots his heart using electricity and returns back to life, bringing God's wrath onto Wiper and Zoro. One thing to note here is that Wiper never falls down, but continues to stand even after being struck, symbolizing that his will to fight remained even after taking all of that damage. This level of will can actually be traced all the way to Wano, as whenever Kaido knocks Luffy out, he remarks feeling Luffy's unconscious gaze and his will to continue to resist or his will to fight. Luffy gets a bombastic return as he emerges from a snake and with the help of Aiza he finds Enel. Enel looks down at Luffy because he is a rubber man and Enel is Kaminari, but Luffy kicks the shit out of Enel. This matchup pisses some fans off because Luffy by some chance has a devil fruit that could perfectly counter Enel's lightning. But this was done intentionally as the reader is supposed to get the reading that Luffy is the natural enemy of God. However, I'm big ass spoiler, so skip ahead if you want. What's funny now is that this is really a fight between a man who thinks he's a God and a man who thinks he's a rubber man, but is in actuality a God. What's important in this fight though is not the clash between Luffy and Enel, but rather it's Wiper's statements and how they correlate with current indigenous resistance movements. Wiper states, It's useless, Enel. You can't topple it. You can't topple the history of the proud warriors who lived in the land of Shandara. That no matter where our strength endures, we will give birth to it and cultivate it. You can't topple that sublime power. No matter how much forests you burn or ruins you crumble, the earth of Shandara will never submit. Ex-God Gunfall is directly impacted by Wiper's words, as in the moment he realizes how foolish he and his ancestors were because none should have the right to claim birth as their own. In this instance, Gunfall understands Wiper and the indigenous teachings about land. The effects of this conclusion will come into effect later, but it's around here where we see two things happen to Wiper. The first is that he's told that Luffy is ringing the bell, which angers him because Luffy doesn't have the right to. But Wiper, who is curious to why Luffy 
a stranger would ring the bell presses on. Robin tells Wiper that an explorer from 400 years ago once said he found a city of gold and nobody believed him and that Luffy wants to inform his descendants. Wiper, the stoic warrior, begins to cry and presses on asking if the descendant's ancestor's name was Mont Blanc Noland. The second thing is that this chance of fate allows Wiper to then trust Luffy enough to ring the bell as he gives him permission to do so by screaming at the top of his lungs. <laughs> Once the bell rings, the war ends, and in the ruins of Shandia, Wiper wakes up to the sounds of drums. He is told that the war has ended and that there is peace between the Sky Islanders and the Shandians. Wiper, in a state of disbelief, pulls the curtains aside, and what is unveiled is a magical scene, as Oda draws people who are once sworn enemies dancing around a fire and having a party in the heavens, but also that they have been liberated from the fear of the existence of a god. This liberation is also amplified by the drums of liberation. It's in this party scene and one of the final scenes where we see the conclusion Gunfall came to come into effect. As Oda shows the cooperation of the two people by first having the Sky Islanders help the Shandians pull up the Golden Bell, but secondly the Sky Islanders are welcomed to stay on Shandian lands through the consensual agreement of the chief. The Shandians also take part in the election of Gunfall as he is reinstated as God, the ruler of the heavens. In synthesizing this, this entire arc is an example of land back and in this scenario the battle with Enel healed tensions between the people of the sky and the Shandians. The battle further allowed the settlers to come to an understanding of the wrongs they committed, but since Sky Island proper was destroyed by Enel, they are welcome to live alongside the Shandians. In the real world, this would differ because what the colonizers took wasn't just an island, but rather vast portions of land and to this day the settlers grasp onto that land with an iron grip. To this day settlers suppress any resistance caused by indigenous peoples as is seen in how the Canadian state has sent armed Royal Canadian military police and their own military to suppress the Wet'suwet'en who are currently protesting the construction of a pipeline that is planned to run through their lands. What is striking is that the Wet'suwet'en territory in question is unceded land, meaning it is not Canadian land, as according to the Royal Proclamation of 1763, Canada can only take land that has been surrendered via a treaty. But even those treaties are not 100% justified because the Canadian officials cheated and lied and almost caged indigenous peoples in tiny lands that had no resources. Further, the Canadian state actively murdered bison to cut the indigenous food supply and withheld rations. Why? Because the Canadian state fully believed in the myth of the disappearing Indian and that indigenous peoples would just die off. And so they held those rations to starve indigenous peoples to death. <laughs> <laughs> 
or force those who did not comply with the reserve system. But indigenous peoples didn't disappear and they did not die off. And to this day, drums are beaten, dances are performed, art is drawn, stories are told and passed on, telling and repeating the single fact that we are still here. That indigenous peoples for five hundred years have been resisting, fighting their colonizers. So while the 400 year war has ended in the One Piece world, the 500 years of resistance here has not. And if someone in the future is watching this, feeling hopeless, feeling lost, I want you to know the story of the great warrior Kadigara, the story of Noland, and the story of Monkey D. Luffy. And I hope they could lift your spirits, much like they lifted mine. <laughs> well, that last part sure felt like a conclusion. But it's not, because we still have to talk about God, or the gods. Skypea is interesting, as to my knowledge, it's the only arc that showcases the beliefs of one of the ancient peoples of One Piece. Like later on, readers will encounter Kuma, who holds a Bible, these random characters who worship gods, the idea that the celestial dragons are the gods of the world from Khorasan, and spoilers, like big spoilers, for the anime, the sun god Nika. But it's here in Skypea where readers are introduced to the ancient gods, the sun god, the god of the rain, and the god of the earth. But the Shandians had certain ceremonies for them. These ancient gods, to a degree, imposed their will on the Shandians through a priest, and even the great warrior Kalgara fears their punishment, as he believed that if his daughter was not sacrificed, the village would continue to die. This is why when Noland asks him, what are you so afraid of? It strikes a nerve. This fear of God is then perfectly utilized by God Enel 400 years later, as he uses his lightning powers to create a pan opticon where a perception is built into the populace, as he could be listening at all times, or he isn't. This God Opticon makes the residents fear Enel even more, and it makes them easy to prey upon and oppress. Luffy, in contrast, does not fear. Luffy doesn't fear God or Enel or the world government, and that's exactly why he is a revolutionary figure and a figure of liberation. For an example, Luffy does something no pirate would ever dare to do. After Skypea, he wages a war against the world by having his comrade in arms, Sogi King, shoot the world government flag. This act of war, this act of rebellion, is why I start my anti fascism video with that moment. Because Luffy rejects. God. He rejects those who oppress people. What's even cooler is that right now in Wano, there's the scene Oda slid into the down low. It features a drunk Marco and Whitebeard. And out of nowhere, Whitebeard asks Marco if he believes in God. Marco calls him drunk. But Whitebeard says that before Marijo was built, 
There was an ancient race that lived atop of the Red Line, and they were considered to be the gods of the One Piece world. I know I'm not the first to make this comparison, but the story of King's people is very similar to the Shandians who had their land stolen by the Skypeans. Furthermore, King is a sky being that eerily resembles the warrior Wiper as he dons a similar tattoo on his face and his people are being hunted down by the world government. This is why King's face is covered. Although we don't get much information on what happened to the Lunarians, as Zoro does ask, but King refuses to tell him, and Zoro throughout the fight has a mocking tone. What's interesting is that King tells Zoro that he, Zoro, is the inferior being, and throughout Sanji's fight with Queen, we learn that the Lunarians can survive in any hostile environments, and in Queen's eyes, King is a monster. So it's interesting hearing this, because the obvious question that Sanji throws out is, well, if these Lunarian people can survive anything, what or who exactly wiped them out? My theory brain is saying Im or Im's descendants. As 800 years ago in the One Piece world, once the world government beat the Ds, in the hundred year void and ushered in the first great cleansing they probably had enough power to suppress the lunarians and steal their homeland thus creating and building the holy land of marijo on top of it which would mean that im descending into that frozen cellar area would mean that that section of Marijo could have been where the Lunarians first lived and now it's just become like a vault where Im stores historical relics that remind him of the distant past. In my mind, Im is like this ancient being who knows the entire history and keeps these relics around because he knows of the will of D and he knows that wills get passed on from D to D. What this implies, though, is that King's people were dragged from their place by the celestial dragons. And thus, the Celestial Dragons became the gods of the One Piece world. In being at the top of the world and atop of the hierarchy, they are able to move the world according to their wills through the use of power and oppression. Fuck you! Why does this matter? Where am I going with all of this? I believe Oda structured the One Piece world after Skypiea, and that Skypiea is really a microcosm of the One Piece world. So like, spoiler, like big, huge, story-shattering spoilers. I came to this conclusion based off what Im Sama is able to do, and how their powers resemble what Enel was able to do, but Im is able to operate at a world level. For an example, Im is able to locate the island Sabo is on and disintegrate it in seconds. This is much like how Enel was able to pinpoint people using hockey across Skypea and eliminate them. Furthermore, instead of four priests, there are five powerful saints. Im differs from Enel though, because their existence is hidden, and once someone does discover their existence, they are eliminated. But Im probably 
uses this status of godhood, like Enel, as it is their will that drives the world, and the world's fate is determined by them. Thus, Im uses this godhood to oppress the people of One Piece and maintain a world fascist order. And even though Luffy is a god, he is a D, and a D who is destined to fight the god of the One Piece world and reject them. No, 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 it's like this. Wowee! <laughs> What's that? The video's the video's fifty-five minutes. What? I have I have less than five minutes to finish this video. Okay, well, um, here we go. First of all, are you even still with me, or are you like Zoro sleeping away from this fifty-five? long video essay slash lecture <laughs> like seriously part four and five are 20 minutes and initially they were 20 minutes each <laughs> if you're still with me thank you Thank you so much for watching this long ass video and I appreciate it so much that I don't believe it. <laughs> so so you got to prove yourself. You got to claim in the comments that you aren't like Zoro. You did not fall asleep to my lecture on colonialism and one piece. <laughs> A gentle reminder, though, if you aren't subscribed, do it. I am 300 subscribers shy from 2,000, and I want to get out of the thousands. That's like a yearly goal I have, so get me out of the thousands and elevate me. Do it. Like, God Usopp. You know how they, they elevate God Usopp? Like, yeah. <laughs> or, if you have a dollar to spare, and you consider my work, worthy of your money consider subbing to my patreon it's linked down below as the great white beard once said i am one man with one heart and i do everything from the research to the writing to the audio recording and the editing and the editing of this video um if you don't have any money that's okay don't feel guilty. You could share this video for free to a friend, to an enemy, or a One Piece hater, or a One Piece lover. Or leave a comment telling me if you learned something, or if you didn't. Um, I don't know how to end this, so stay tuned for more One Piece video essays, and I'm running out of time, so sit down, bye bye ビビったろ。<笑><笑><笑><笑><笑><笑>